praise the Lord. Good morning, good morning. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I want to just uh, uh, pray a blessing over all of you who are having the opportunity to listen. I pray that we would open our hearts right now. And I am grateful that wherever we are, God can meet us right there. And I pray that we would bring our hearts to a place of surrender, unconditional surrender to the Lord and that we would be ready to receive what God has for us. So I pray that where you are right now, that you would lift up your voice and that you would give thanks and that you would uh, acknowledge the Lord as being the source of every good and perfect gift in your life. We're going to have a scripture reading as we often do. I'm reading uh, today from Psalm 27, and I'm gonna read just the first six verses. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Bow your heads with me as we look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for your provision, for you have provided all for all our needs. We thank you for your protection, for you have built a hedge about us and kept us, Lord. I thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your direction, for your provision. We thank you for your protection. We thank you, Lord, for the mind of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for a desire that burns within us to serve you and to worship you with all our hearts. Father, I pray right now. Lord, that you would move in the life of every person, that you would, Lord, reveal yourself to each one, that you would, Lord, just show us what it is you would have us to do, and, Lord, give us the strength and the courage to go forth and do it. We ask all these things in the name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please uh, join us as we worship and praise the Lord this morning.
our heart, our soul, our spirit, our mind. Because when we come into his presence, it's holy ground. Amen. Let's just worship the Lord and realize we're on holy ground. It doesn't matter if you're in your home, in your car, if you're in the sanctuary. Whenever you stop and worship the Lord, he's with you. And that makes it holy ground. Amen.
I just wanted to take a little moment to acknowledge all of the people that have served our country, men and women alike, whether you've been in the armed services, whether you've been a police officer, a firefighter, or uh, anyone on the front lines. We just thank you for your service. We remember this day the people that have really sacrificed. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Freedom is a gift and it's a treasure. And although that's true, it's easy to forget. But precious gifts are not free. They come with sacrifice. Men and women in uniform, we say thank you. To the veterans, we say thank you. We are so grateful for your love, sacrifice, and your service. And all of that points us directly to the greatest love of all, and that is Jesus Christ. I just wanted to say this short little prayer. We thank you, Lord, for giving us freedom. We thank you for the price that Christ paid on Calvary so that we might be free, Lord. Remember today the cost of it all, the great sacrifice for freedom. Lord, we just thank you for the brave men and women who have fought and continue to fight so courageously for our nation. Lord, I pray for their covering and your blessing over them and their families. We pray that you would graciously encircle them, Lord, with your peace. And we pray for your great favor and goodness to be evident in their lives. Lord, please be with all those in uniform and so those that do serve our nation. Lord, we just ask for your protection and the guiding force that would keep them safe. Help them to walk wisely, Lord, to stay covered in your armor. Give them godly discernment. Lord, make them aware of what lurks close behind, but also help the men and women, Lord, to realize that what they're doing is being resolute, determined, and unwavering. Father, bless their families, bless those they love. Give them your great favor this day, Lord, we pray. And we would like to sing a song about blessing America. I do want to say, I'm sure most of you have in your family someone that you know that has served. I want to say thank you to my dad, Louis Culber. He was in the National Guard. He was a Florida Highway Patrolman. And also I have two nephews, one who's a Marine, one who's a commissioned officer in the Army. I thank so many family members, and I know you want to thank them. Reach out to your family. Thank them for their service. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, yes, we do also want to acknowledge uh, Doug Messina, who's here with us this morning, who is also a veteran. Uh, so we honor you today as well. 
Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. My name is Pastor Raphael Acevedo, and we are at Yeoman's Praise and Worship Center. We consider it a great blessing to be able to meet with you uh, once again today. Uh, if you open your heart wherever you are, I am very confident that God will meet you and that God will minister to you. Uh, a week ago Saturday was Armed Forces Day. It is a day set aside to pay special tribute to all the men and women who are serving in the armed forces today. Every year on November 11th, we celebrate Veterans Day. And that is a day to honor all those who have served in the military at one time in the past, uh, whether they are still alive or have passed away. This is Memorial Day weekend. Every year on the last Monday in May, we honor the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. As I have shared with you before, I have never served in the armed forces, but I have a great respect and admiration for those that have. I believe that they are worthy of tremendous honor for their service to our country and for what they have done to preserve our freedoms. Today we pay tribute to those that paid the ultimate sacrifice and gave their life for this country. This morning I'm also reminded of all the millions of Christian soldiers that have laid down their lives for the cause of Christ. We find them throughout the pages of scripture. They are not limited to the Bible though. Church history also tells us of the multitudes of brothers and sisters, uh, soldiers of the cross, who were martyred because of their faith in Christ. But I also want to remind you that we are not limited to historical figures either. As I try to often remind you, we have precious brothers and sisters in Christ that are laying down their lives for the cause of Christ right now, all around the world. I honor them as well this morning. Now, although I mentioned I never served in the U.S. military, but I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. And that's not only my calling, but the calling of every born-again Christian. But today I want to talk to you about something that every soldier in the Lord's army and every martyr of the cross has already discovered, and that is the faithfulness of God. When everything around you is uncertain, like things are right now, the only thing that will keep your feet firmly on the rock is trusting in the faithfulness of God. Uh, so please turn with me to our text for this morning. Just one verse found in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 7 and verse 9. Deuteronomy, chapter 7 and verse 9. And it reads as follows. Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Bow your heads with me one more time as we look to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do thank you, Lord, for, uh, Lord, your presence here among us. I thank you, Lord, that you are uh, omnipotent, that you are omnipresent. Lord, that wherever your name is being lifted up, you're right there. I pray right now that we will have a heart like those of the prophets of old, that would cry out and say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, let your word, the seed of life, find fertile ground in the soil of our hearts right now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now the first thing I want you to notice from our text is that it says that the God that we serve, the God that we refer to as our God, He really is God. He is the one true God. There's only one, you know. 
In John chapter 17, verse 3, as Jesus was praying to the Father, he said this, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In Isaiah chapter 43, verses 10 and 11, God spoke this powerful word to the nation of Israel. Reading from the New Living Translation, it says, But you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been, and there never will be. I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. Now, over the years, man, in his ignorance and spiritual blindness, has bowed down and made a God out of just about anything. In the book of Romans chapter 1, we read this. It says, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worship and serve the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Now think about this for a moment. Even the nation of Israel, who witnessed the power of God like no other nation in the world, even they bow down and worship to created things. Do you remember that after the Exodus, uh, at the very same time that Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, the people got together and they made a golden calf and they worshipped it. We laugh at them and we think that they were so foolish. But what we do is not very different. No, we don't bow down to a golden calf, but we make a God out of success and out of pleasure and out of power and fame and out of possessions. But what we worship more than anything else is ourselves. Our altar is the mirror and the image is the what we see before us. I must make myself happy. I must feel fulfilled and important. I want everybody else to think that I'm great and worthy of praise. The one that we love with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength is so often not the Lord, but ourselves. But our text says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God. Not you, not me, not anything that this world has created, not anything that we long for or, or desire to have or to experience. No, the Lord, He is God. And the same God is the one that meets us right here every time we gather together and He's here right now. Our text says, know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God. And he goes on to say, He is the faithful God. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that I am so very, very glad that the God we serve is the faithful God. And this speaks not only of what he does, but of who he is. It is his very nature to be faithful. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, the apostle Paul wrote this. He said, if we believe not, he, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. It's who he is. And the wonderful faithfulness of God is manifested in many ways. I'd like us to look at a few of those ways. When I think of the faithfulness of God, one of the first things I think of is the fact that God is constant. 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And that is such a reassuring thought when you live in a world that is constantly changing. You realize that the style of clothes we wear changes quickly. The style of music we listen to changes all the time. The vocabulary that's considered hip at that moment changes right away. The people that were popular six months ago have been replaced by the newest person that has hit the scene. When you stop and think about it, there are very few things in our life that stay the same. Our bodies are changing. Most of us cannot do the same things today that we did 20 years ago. Our vision and our hearing may not be as good as it used to be. I said things change all the time. Our circumstances also seem to change often. You may find yourself on top of the mountain today, but you may be in the valley tomorrow. Jobs are here today and gone tomorrow. All I'm saying is that sometimes it seems like the only thing we can count on in this world is that things are going to change. We have even coined the phrase, nothing stays the same forever. In a world that is constantly changing, I'm glad that there is one thing that always stays the same, and that is our God. He is the faithful God. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God says, For I am the Lord, I change not. His faithfulness is demonstrated in the fact that he is constant. He's always the same. We don't have to worry about what kind of mood he'll be in the next time we talk to him. And he doesn't change his opinion on things. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29, tells us that God is not a man that he should change his mind. Do you realize that what God declared to be wrong 6,000 years ago, he still says is wrong today? What he commanded us to do 6,000 years ago, he still commands us to do today. He is the faithful God. He still hates sin and he still loves righteousness. He does not change with the time. He's not swayed by public opinion. He is the faithful God that changes not. So we don't have to approach him with any uncertainty. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23, the prophet Jeremiah was overwhelmed with the faithfulness of God. And he proclaimed, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions <coughs> fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Aren't you glad that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Now, the, the Bible mentions several specific areas where the faithfulness of God is demonstrated. And it touches us right where we live. And, and I want to point out the, a few of them to you. The first area where we can especially experience the faithfulness of God is in the midst of our suffering. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19 says this, Wherefore, uh, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now, there are a lot of people who have a hard time accepting the plain truth found in this scripture, which is simply this. It is sometimes the will of God that we suffer. Sometimes the path that God has laid out for us to walk on brings us to a place of suffering. You say, well, that doesn't sound right. Well, wasn't that the case with our Lord Jesus and with the apostles and the prophets? During those times, we must believe that he has a purpose and he wants to fulfill that, well, that we may, that even though we may not understand what it is. But the psalmist had it right when he said, as for God, his way is perfect. 
So when you find ourselves suffering through no fault of our own, we are admonished to commit the keeping of our souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. But what does that mean? It means that during those times, those difficult times, we must simply place ourselves in the hands of God and trust him no matter what. We have to be ready to say, Lord, I put my soul in your hands regardless of the circumstances. I commit myself to you in the situation, even if it never changes. Now, someone may ask, how can anyone do that? We can do it because he is the faithful creator. If you are suffering right now, God's word of encouragement to you is this. Hold on. Put your trust in me. It's going to get better. But he tells us that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. You know, the second way that we can especially experience the faithfulness of God is in his ability to deliver us from the spiritual powers of darkness. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul wrote this, And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Now let me remind you, uh, just in case uh, you have forgotten, that there is a real devil out there that desires more than anything else to destroy you and to cause you to forfeit your soul. I also want you to realize that in our own strength, <coughs> none of us are a match for the enemy. The only thing that keeps him from getting the victory over us is the faithfulness of God. God promises to do two things for us in our battle against Satan. First of all, he will strengthen us. He will give us the power to overcome. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Church, God is faithful. He will not leave us defenseless against the enemy of our soul. But when we feel we're so worn out by the battle that we can't fight anymore, he promises to protect us himself. We have no reason to be afraid of the devil because God is faithful and he will strengthen and protect us. Let me share with you the third way that God especially demonstrates his faithfulness to us, and that's during times of temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the Apostle Paul wrote this, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I, I want you to understand that the devil has a trap laid out for you already. Every day he's trying to set you up. He sends people your way that will try to influence you to do wrong. He tries to put thoughts in our minds that are contrary to the will of God. He has watched you long enough that he knows your areas of weakness. He knows what you and I struggle with. He knows when we are tired and discouraged and are more susceptible to temptation. But the Bible tells us that we are not the only ones that are being tempted. Everybody is going through a similar trial. But God is faithful. And this is an absolutely true statement that has no exceptions. God will not allow any temptation to come into your life that you cannot overcome. We have no reason to fail. We have no excuse to give in. He's faithful. 
when we are tempted to sin, the Bible says he's already made a way of escape and all you have to do is to look for it. Somewhere in the midst of those circumstances, there's a way out. We may not see it right away, but it's nonetheless there. There is a fourth area in which God especially demonstrates his faithfulness. It's related to what we just talked about. Although God always provides a way of escape so that we don't have to give in to temptation, the reality is that sometimes we nonetheless fall. It may be because the temptation came upon us so suddenly that we reacted before we knew what hit us. It may be because we got so caught up in our emotions at the moment and we did not, did not think through the situation. But for whatever reason, sometimes we just mess up. But he's the faithful God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we read, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, he's faithful to forgive. There may be some listening to me right now and your heart is broken because during the course of this last week, you, you let God down one more time. But I want to tell you something. He's faithful to forgive. The Apostle John wrote this. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You know, that means that Jesus Please, our case with the Father. And he'll say something like this. Father, I shed my blood on Calvary's hill so that they might be forgiven. Charge their sin to my account. If you have fallen short, throw yourself on the mercy seat of God and confess your sins. And God will be faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The church, you know, we ought to thank God every single day for his great faithfulness to us. But let me add this idea as well. God wants us to be faithful as well. Paul wrote to the Corinthians saying this, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Now, I want you to listen very closely to me. I am persuaded that the one single quality that God looks for most in people is faithfulness. Finding people that are gifted and talented is not too difficult for God because he's the one uh, that gave us those things in the first place. Having an education is good, but God can use uneducated people. Having someone who's able to speak eloquently may impress some of us, but God is able to grab a hold of a person who stutters so bad they can barely get the words out, and he can anoint them and use them powerfully in miraculous ways. Just look at the life of Moses. You see, I've come to the conclusion that there's really only one thing that we can offer to God that he did not first give to us, and that is our faithfulness. And it is one of the characteristics that is most precious to God. It is the one thing that all of us can offer. Now listen to me, church. If we can't do anything else, we can be faithful. And that is a beautiful thing to God. Now let me just share one more thought with you, and then I'm going to close. In the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus spoke these words. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It would be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time 
And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he's not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. But there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now as we look at this, I noted that there are several similarities that we have with the servants in this illustration. Just like them, we have been assigned with a task that we must do for the master while he's away. And just like those servants, we too have been waiting a long time for the, our master to return. And like those two servants, we have a choice to make. We can follow the path of the wicked servant and ignore our responsibilities and make the huge mistake of not preparing ourselves for the Lord's return. Jesus said it would be disastrous for that servant that is found neglecting his duties when the master returns. Or we can be like the wise and faithful servant who is actively doing the work of the Lord when his master comes back. Jesus said that servant would be greatly rewarded. My question to you is a simple one. When Jesus comes back, will he find you to be like the wise and faithful servant? Or will he find you to be like the wicked servant? Will you be ready? Or will you be found unprepared? Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God. And he's looking for faithful servants who he will find busy doing the work that was assigned to them when he comes back. I want us to bow our heads and pray. Uh, before we do that, I want to encourage you. Uh, wherever you are in your walk with the Lord, God can meet you right there. Well, whatever situations you're facing, whatever trials you're going through, whatever difficulties you're in the midst of, God can give you the victory. Some of you may say, well, I, I know my heart's not right with God. Then I want to tell you, you can make things right right now. You can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. Some of you have drifted from where you once were. You can come back to the lover of your soul. And you can rededicate your life to him right now. Let me tell you something. No matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've fallen, God loves you with an everlasting love. And his desire is to save you and to have you spend eternity with him. Look to the Lord with me. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your presence right here. I thank you, Lord, for each person that is listening to the sound of my voice. I pray, Father, meet them right where they are. Lord, draw them to yourself. Convict them of sin. Bring them to a place of unconditional surrender. And I pray, Father, that you might let your power fall fresh upon them, that you may set them free from any bondage of the enemy and that you may allow them to rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit and to go forth in victory. Father, I pray, Lord, that there will be many that will give their hearts to you right now. Father, I thank you, Lord. You are the faithful God and we bless your holy name. Father, we ask all of this in the name of Jesus, be glorified everywhere. Amen.